Cambridge Church. How are we doing this morning? Good. We doing okay? Yeah, I want to give a a huge shout out to the tech team for working through a lot of issues this morning. And I want to give a huge shout out to families, to those who are enjoying breakfast in bed and watching from home because dads and littles made you breakfast, moms. Hats off to you. Great job. Hey, listen, we are super excited. I am super excited to start this new sermon series. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I have a particular passion for God's word. Like I wanna get to what it really says and what it really means and for us to understand as much as we can. And there's just a lot of bad explanations of scripture out of there. There's a lot of things that we have made assumptions about as a society that we take from the world and we layer over scripture to view it through the world's lens. And so this new sermon series, Coffee Mug Christianity, is all about dealing with cliches, by dealing with the context that they're given in, by um, unpacking just getting clarity No pun intended. Y'all give Mark props for that for next door. But gaining clarity on those things. So I'm really grateful for that opportunity for us. Um, It's going to feel a little more teachy, right? Like I can't can't teach giving you uh, one scripture out of context and then only give you one scripture to show you the full counsel of God's word. So it may feel a little different a couple of the weeks as we dig in. If you're a note taker, get your pens out now because there's gonna be a lot of different scriptures with one solid message because what we know is God's word is faithful from beginning to end. And when there are themes, we will see them throughout scripture. Amen? Amen. Amen. It is not a lecture, I promise. Y'all good? Y'all awake? We prayed for the rain to stop, the cold came, I don't know what we're doing, but it's okay because it's not raining anymore for the moment anyway. So listen, yeah, listen, this morning we want to deal with this statement that so many of us heard, God helps those who help themselves. You guys heard that? You know that? What is the matter? Good morning. Good morning. I'm just going to move this right over here for you if that's okay. 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 Hi, online family. We really do love you, and we're really sorry the house lights are out. We're not sitting in the dark here, but that is the only light coming from down there that you have. So thank you, Pastor Rick, for the adjustment. He was st- we just keep it real at Bridge Church. He was standing in the back, but he wasn't giving me arm movements. I had no idea why he was standing back there looking at me. So there we go. So listen, let's do a do-over. And so we have all heard the statement that God helps those who help themselves, Right? You've heard that statement. We're familiar with that statement. Um, Do you know that in 2017, Barna did a study and 52% of practicing Christians, not Christmas and Easter Christians, practicing throughout the year Christians, 52% strongly agreed that God helps those who help themselves was a biblical statement. Do you know the origin of that statement? Some people credit that statement to Ben Franklin, but it dials back a little bit before that. In 1698, there was this British politician, Algernon Sidney, and in the Articles of Discourse Concerning Government, that sounds like a yawn, right? I promise the teaching won't be that boring. But um, (laughs) he made that statement. But if we're really honest, political statements in a write-up from 300, 400 years ago, they don't get the kind of traction that God helps those who help themselves gets, right? So I dialed it back a little further. Can we put up that Aesop slide? Aesop's fables, Hercules and the Wagoneer, God saw the Wagoneer needed help, and the, and the Wagoneer cried out, and it says really small down here, nope, the God says, set your shoulder yourself to the wheel. The gods help those who help themselves. So we as Christians are running around quoting Aesop and accrediting myth to God. It isn't true. That's why we said the lie is, right? And so regardless of the origin, the reality is that the statement is contrary to Scripture. And so we have to dig out what it really came from, why we buy into that. And I have to tell us it's a really harmful phrase because our society is fixated on helping ourselves. Self-help is a multi-billion dollar industry. Our culture is so fixated on self and selfishness, we're obsessed 
And in that, we have this multi-billion dollar industry that continually inundates us with false hope. False hope that we can make it better. False hope that we can pick ourselves up by our bootstraps. False hope that if we just do a little better and then we layer on as Christians, then God will help us out a little bit more. And the reality is when it comes to our relationship with God, self-reliance actually moves us away from God instead of towards God. Have you tried to do life away from God? I I know I did. I don't know how it worked for you. It didn't work at all for me. I think of a time um, when Israel was being established as a nation and God told them, like, basically God was like, you're new at this. Like, you can't do anything without coming to me first. And even if you weren't new at this, you can't do anything without coming to me first. So God told them, don't enter into any covenants with any other nations. Don't do it. Come see me first. And this other nation came and pretended to be heard, and they dirtied up their clothes like scripture. Anyway, Israel got tricked. And they entered into a covenant under God's name. They entered under a covenant that they didn't consult God about. And then when it went really bad and they found out they'd been tricked, they came crying to God. And God was like, what did I tell you? You thought you could do it on your own. Come and check in with me. Can I tell you how much I wish I'd have read that and taken that lesson to heart really early in my Christian walk? really early in my marriage or in my parenting or my friendships, if I had learned to just, no matter what I think I know, just do a quick check-in with God. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So so what I'm not going to do is say there's no element of truth to the statement, God helps those who help themselves. Like, whenever something really catches traction, there's always elements of truth to it, right? I don't... um, Yeah, something that has stuck with me that Pastor Mike taught for years. Listen to what your friends say, there's some truth to it. Listen to what your enemies say, there's some truth to it, right? Whenever we have something that takes hold and gets traction, somewhere in there, there's some truth to it. And so I can't, we can't equip ourselves to face the lie if we don't deal with some of the reasons that we think these passages are true. And so I just want to pull up, we've got Proverbs 14, 23 that says, work brings profit, but mere talk leads to poverty. Sounds like we should work, right? Sounds like we should work, right? Okay. Whoo, the booth is awake at least. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. That's pretty harsh. We hear that one all the time. Uh, but it's, again, it's pulled out of context. And so we'll, we might jump into that at another time. But those statements, that's where we get some truths. But what those statements do, what God is saying is you need to work hard. Yeah. Faith without works is dead. Absolutely. But it doesn't say God won't help you if you don't start helping yourself. Proverbs 19, 15, actually, I love this from the Amplified, says, laziness casts one into a deep sleep, unmindful of lost opportunity, and the idle person will suffer hunger. Well, there's some great advice about how to work hard in that, right? But, but, but there's a problem when we hinge everything on the work that we do. There's actually two problems. First, humans want to be their own saviors. We have wanted to do this since the beginning of time. From Adam and Eve, we have wanted to have the answer for ourselves. We want glory for our accomplishments. We want to do a great job so we get all the applause. And that becomes this self-fulfilling, self-feeding. Can I tell us that culture is pretty narcissistic right now? This self-fulfilling, self-feeding, I can do it, I can fix it, I've got all the answers. And all of that reinforces self-centeredness rather than teaching us to seek the one who can really, truly solve our problems, who really, truly has the power to change lives. And so inwardly, when we buy into this lie, inwardly what that does is we become our own first source of solution. We become our own first source of strength. We become our own first source of prosperity. And can I tell you that scripture talks about that? 
Like even back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 8, 17 says, you may say to yourself, my power, I'm just gonna put my, in, my inflection on that, right? But that's how I read the scripture. My power and my strength of my hands produce this wealth for me, 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 me. How often do we hear that from people? How often do we think that? Oh, if we're honest, how often do we think that for ourselves? The passage goes on to say, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. We aren't the first source, guys. God is the first source. And so that's the inward risk. The outward risk is that outwardly when we buy into this, we become judge and jury for the rest of the world, determining by our judgment who deserves for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in their lives. Right? Who deserves to receive some help? Because they need to help themselves too, right? Well, yeah, we teach people to fish. Yeah, we teach people to grow crops. But we got to see them and know them and love them before we can teach them anything. It's quiet in the house this morning. We forget in our, in our judgment of others and what they're earning and how they're doing and what they deserve. We forget that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We forget where we were when he picked us up out of the miry muck. And that's not a good thing. And I can tell you, it's easy to do. Like I, I came up, um, I, I had a really rough upbringing. And there are certain triggers for me that if I get around people that are exhibiting that behavior, man, does my judgment meter come on. Like, y'all think your pastor's all, well, no, you know me better than that. You know I'm not all sweet and wonderful all the time. So we'll skip past that because we keep it real here. But, like, I, I have to be careful because, man, in an instant I can judge a mom who's not taking care of their child. In an instant I can judge somebody who's spending their kid's grocery money on drugs or alcohol or something else. Man, and yet, Jesus picked me up out of the mud when I was a mess and I was doing all the wrong things. Jesus is talking to the crowds in Matthew 25 about this very thing, right? He says to them, let's see, do we have Matthew 25, 44, and 45 up there? Yes, we do. Thank you. So I'm going to have you guys read this with me. He's talking to the crowds and he's talking about them about when he's going to come back. When he's going to come back again, and, this, and, and when they will stand before him in judgment. And I'd like you to read with me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. You see, because he's told them, you're going to come before me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say no. And they said, well, why? And he said, because you didn't help them, and by not helping them, you didn't acknowledge me. The truth is that God has always promised to help the helpless. We can go back Old Covenant. We can go back Old Testament. Isaiah 25, 4 says, You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm, and a shade from the heat. Okay, let me, so he's a refuge to those who work hard. He's a refuge to the wealthy, a tax shelter, a good, you know. He's the helps those who help themselves because I see that he is a refuge for the poor and the needy. He shelters us in the storm and in the heat of the day. He, and he doesn't leave it for just him. He commands us to do the same. Deuteronomy 15.11 says, poor persons will never disappear from the earth. That's why I'm giving you this command. You must open your hand generously to your fellow Israelites, to the needy among you, and to the poor who live with you in your land. Can I tell you that's one of those moments where we don't get the context? We read that as help, help the Israelites. 
Help the people who live in your community, like help your tribe. But the breakout of that scripture is help the Israelites, help your tribe. It is help those, I lost my passage here, hang on. Help those who are needy among you. So not just your tribe, but those who have physical or, or financial ailments, who have problems and struggles. And then help the poor who live with you in your land. That's the foreigners. That's the not Israelites. Those are the homeless people, the beggars who come from other nations who have nothing. And God tells them, you don't just help your own tribe. You help the people who are like you and the people who are not like you, the people who are in your circumstance and the people who are not in your circumstance. You help them all. And we get those commands, guys, under the old covenant, pre-Jesus. And can I tell you, it was such a struggle for Israel because how could they help other people when they were continually falling short of God's law, right? And it can feel like that for us sometimes, but we have it so much better under the new covenant because under the new covenant, Jesus intervened and it wasn't about meeting the law anymore. Jesus came to take the law and offer us love instead. See, we, we can celebrate today. We can walk through hard times and difficult times and great times and joyful times because we aren't continually 24-7, 365, trying to make our checklists of do's and don'ts and musts. Now, in God's love, do we begin to live righteously? Yes. Do, do, we, do we try to eliminate the don'ts from our life and try to lean into the do's? Absolutely. But our life no longer depends on it. Our life no longer depends on what we can accomplish because let me go back to while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came because we couldn't help ourselves enough and in that Jesus turned to the most outcast, the most rejected. He turned to the most despised and disliked. And not only did he give us that as an example but he taught us exactly why he did it. I'd like you to read with me Luke 5, 27 and 28. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Jesus went to the cheater and the crook. Jesus went to the traitor. Jesus went to the Jew who sold out the other Jews to make money off of their hard work. That's where Jesus went. And he didn't just go to him to offer him help. He went to him to invite him to a seat at the table. He went to him to invite him in. Can I ask us a hard question? Uh -uh. I'll just pretend there's the mirror right here because it's Mother's Day, so I'm just going to ask me a hard question. When is the last time I offered someone who didn't belong not only a look or a nod or a dollar, but when is the last time I offered someone who didn't belong a seat at the table? Read with me. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. Pause. Why were the tax collectors the large crowd? Because nobody else would eat at a table with them. That's why. Everybody else despised them. Okay, well, let's just keep reading with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law Mm, let me read that to you. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Now what I want us to notice about that is Levi didn't just respond, or Levi didn't respond in anger. The religious leaders looked down on the tax collectors, rightfully so, the tax collectors were thieves and crooks. But a lot of times thieves and crooks will react in anger and pushing people away, right? 
Levi didn't react like that. Levi reacted with gratitude and giving Jesus honor. And, and in that, <laughs> let me ask a question. Can you remember a time when you were the one that nobody wanted to hang around? Can you remember a time when you were the outcast? Can you remember a time when you were the outcast that someone saw, that someone noticed? Maybe you weren't an outcast. Maybe you were just quiet in the background, and someone really important came up and saw you, noticed you, had a conversation with you sought you out in the crowd and you were like, like someone points from across the room and you're like, oh, you mean me? Like, you mean me? And you go over because you were noticed? I, I was working through this and it was actually before I knew they were gonna be here today, but there was a time when Dylan was at Disney. Uh, we took him and he was four or five. And um, you ever been a little kid and go to Disney World? And so D- Dylan goes up, and he's in the line with all the kids, and he's waiting at the castle because we're going to have lunch there. And all of a sudden, Cinderella's right there. And Cinderella looked at Dylan, and Dylan got to sit up in the throne chair beside her. And if a five-year-old could fall hopelessly in love, I have the picture. He is just looking at Cinderella like, you see me? Pastor Rick said that is true. That's what Jesus does for us. Now, Jesus doesn't walk away and leave us hoping and longing like Cinderella left Dylan, which, by the way, was a great thing because, Holly, hands down, you're better than Cinderella any day of the week. But that's what Jesus does for us. The religious leaders who were supposed to extend the love of God, because I'm pretty sure that they were commanded, even in the Old Testament, to, to look after the needy and the poor and those who needed help to minister to those who were hated and dejected like the tax collectors. But how did they respond? That They responded with anger and with pride and with arrogance. And in their challenge to Jesus, to his disciples, this is something you'll see throughout scripture, by the way, just a tip. There's all the time the Pharisees, especially the first two years, don't have the nerve to confront Jesus, so they'll confront Jesus' disciples. Jesus always answers them. I love it. Like they go to add, like somebody asking the staff a question because they're upset about something and I hear, except, you know, you guys would never do that, so we don't have to worry about that here. But they, they get all upset with the, d- the disciples and they say, well, why are you doing this? Why are you eating with, sick, or with sinners and people that are outcast? And Jesus answers them. He said, it's not the wealthy or the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come for the righteous, but sinners, call sinners to repentance. You see, Jesus came for us when we could not help ourselves. Mm. Jesus came for us when we weren't even trying. Levi was sitting in the tax collector's booth. He wasn't at the temple repenting. Jesus comes for us when we're not even trying. And not only did he come to help us helpless people, and then leave like Cinderella did with nothing. He left us with this covenant and this promise. But he also didn't leave us alone. He left us with a helper. Read with me John 14, 16, and 17. Maybe. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever the spirit of truth, but you know him for he lives with you and he will be in you. There's a little piece in the middle we didn't cover, but Jesus says, I'm not just gonna come to save you. I'm gonna give you a helper that's gonna help you and he's gonna be with you and he's gonna remember everything I've said to you. It goes on further in the passage and says, Um, Jesus tells them, he will teach you all things and remind you everything I have said to you. 
can I ask a question? How many times have we felt shame and inadequacy? How many times have we been so hot on ourselves, even after we've repented, even after we've said we were sorry, because we feel like we just can't shake the bad of what we've done? Can I tell you, Jesus said, come up out of that? Not only come up out of that, but I know you can't do it on your own. I'm going to give you a helper. Now, here's the flip side, guys. We have to cooperate with the helper. Like, we have a choice. We can hear the internal voice that says, oh, you can do it yourself. You can do it on your own. You can go do that. Don't worry about that. Or I can have this. It won't hurt me. And we have to choose whether to yield to that voice or to listen to the voice that says, wait, pause. That's not good for you. Don't do that. Run. You know, there's a passage that says um, God will always provide you a way out. Like in the, the way that it's written, it actually means like God will always provide you an escape door. I remember there was a time many, many years ago where I was somewhere I should not have been about to do something I really should not have done and didn't. And that, that verse popped in my mind and I literally locked across the room at the door, picked up my purse and walked out. But you gotta listen, you gotta yield. See, we have a response. Jesus tells us, that he's always going to listen. He tells us in Matthew 7, 7 and 8, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks find. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Our part is simply asking. We like to preach that as a salvation verse. It's not a salvation verse. It's not a new believer's verse. It's a verse for believers who know the Lord. And he's saying, when you need something, knock. I will answer. Ask me. I will come to you. I will help you out. Why don't we do that? Right? Stupid. stupid. Yes, we don't use that word a lot, but the kids aren't in the room. She's too little. Yes, stupid. Right? Right? Because can I ask a question? Who likes to ask for help? Raise your hand. Oh, good for you, Bradley. Who besides Bradley likes asking for help? Rick Legacy? I know better. We don't like, a, so we got a couple, of, we don't like asking for help. Why is that? Can I tell you it's because it, it means admitting we need help and it suggests submitting to the help we get. And we don't like to be needy, and we definitely don't want to submit to anyone else's authority. Moms, we get this all the time with our kids, dads too, teachers, anybody who's around little children, especially when they're in that like toddler age, like three to five, where they're like, they need help with their shoe, and they want help, and then the next second they're like, I can do it, except you've never taught them to tie their shoe, and they spend five minutes just tugging on strings, getting more and more. Has anybody ever been there? Was it just my sons that were this stubborn? No, no. I know better. Mary educates me on these things, right? How many times is God saying, I'll help you tie your shoe. I'll help you cross the street safely. I'll help you talk to your mom or dad the right way. Your wife, your husband, your boss, your friend, your sibling. Just have to ask. Be willing to receive an answer. That's the inward response. Then we have this whole outward response. This whole outward response that somehow Satan has turned into a political debate on how we help people or don't help people has turned into a platform for policies and politics. Can we leave all the politics aside? Can we not think through a political lens at all? Can we just take scripture? Because we aren't the judge and jury who gets to decide who needs us to be Jesus' hands and feet in their lives. James 2, 14 to 17. Do we have that one? Nope, we just have the reference up there. 
James 2, 14 to 17 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Can I share with you what a privilege it is for Pastor Rick and I to be your pastors? A couple months ago, actually it was just about a month ago, I got a note from one of the community leaders and she was talking about all the great things that she sees Bridge Church doing in the community. And she said, you're actually doing it instead of just giving well wishes and good thoughts and prayers. You guys, seen, known, and loved, you have taken it to heart. This is not a lecture, it is a celebration, but it is a reminder because we can so easily fall away from the pattern when we believe the lies that get twisted and turned and manipulated. And so we have to remember that it is whether it is for ourselves, struggling to tie our shoe when we don't know how yet, <laughs> or make a decision, or whether it is for others, we have to cooperate with the helper and we have to use what he gives us to help others. Are we okay with that, church? Whether they deserve it or not. And I'm not talking about enabling. That's a whole nother sermon for a whole nother day. There's an invitation for us in all of this, right? We had the lie. We looked at the origin of the lie. We have some of the truth where we can get it confused with scripture or pieces and parts. We have the actual truth. We have our part in it. What are we going to do with it? Our response. And then we have an invitation. And before we jump into the invitation, I'd like to give you one more place where this scripture has, or this thought, this idea has been twisted, manipulated, and taught. And do we have that Quran passage up there? The Quran says, Allah never changes the condition of a people unless they strive to change themselves. That's not just the Quran, that's the world we live in. It's all about what you can do for you. You have to earn it. And that leaves us broken, constantly looking to and failing ourselves. And Jesus offers something different. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us approach God's throne of grace, not with fear, not with insufficiency, not with lack. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Guys, the bottom line is not that God helps those who help themselves. The bottom line is that God helps us when we can't help ourselves. And not only does he help us when we can't help ourselves, he invites us to cooperate in his work and he commissions us to go and help others in the same way. That's where God leaves us today. And that leaves us with a challenge, right? Internally, can I ask? Do, no out loud responses and no poking your neighbor, your spouse, your child, your parent, like this is just about you, okay? But where have you been leaning into self-reliance instead of leaning into God? Where have you been turning down the voice of the helper when he's trying to lead you?
let him lead. Accept the help. You'll go so much further. I'll go so much further. And where have we been judge and jury? There was a there was a man Rick and I spent the weekend in DC, probably 15 years ago, maybe 10. And we spent the weekend to go to his company party, and um, there was a gentleman who had slept on the street, and I felt the need, like I just felt prompted, like get him coffee, like go get him breakfast and coffee, right? And uh, we offered him breakfast and coffee, and he went to clean up, and, and it was a busy morning, like it was Sunday, but there was still a lot of people running in and out in the coffee bar. I remember I went to make my coffee, and it was a mess. I kind of tried to pick around the mess. You ever go to a dirty coffee bar? And this homeless man went to the coffee bar to make his coffee that we had bought for him. And before he made his coffee, he got napkins. He picked up all the trash. He cleaned up the coffee bar that everybody else had left or added to the mess for. And he cleaned it all up before he took care of his stuff neatly and went and sat at a table in the far corner so his smell wouldn't offend anyone. When we are judge and jury over who deserves help and who doesn't, we miss those moments. We miss the opportunity to help others with the very same help that we receive. And so today... I just want to invite us into a posture, first and foremost, of receiving. It's not on us. God's got us. We don't have to be enough. We don't have to figure it out. He will. And in that power of receiving with our hands open, allow God to overflow through you to let that help pour out unconditionally and just wait and see what God will do. Amen. If you would stand and pray with me. Father God, we thank you as always for reminders from your word about how much you love us that we needn't be ready, that we needn't be perfect before you'll receive us, before you'll care for us, before you love us, that we don't have to work for our salvation, that we don't have to work for love from you. Thank you for that. And God, continue to prick our hearts so that we remember to do the same for others that we are indeed your hands and feet and that we will see others the way you see us with the same level of grace, the same level of forgiveness, recognizing that we don't have to get ready before we come to you. And neither does anyone else. Forgive us, God, when we've been judgmental. Help us to love better to receive love better. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.